Ira Flato, the host of Science Friday, is going to come out and introduce them uh, one by one. Ira, um, Ira, you want to come out? <laughs> Thank you all for coming and enjoy the, uh, this great panel. Thank you, Doran. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. How many of you have seen this film before? <laughs> Just wanted to make sure whether, it took me three times when I saw it, the first time it was out, and the first time around. I had to go see it three times to understand the, the, the middle to the end, and I'm not sure I still understand it either. But I think we're all in the same boat here. Um, I want to welcome you all to this panel discussion. Um, it certainly is a groundbreaking film in many ways, and uh, I hope you all enjoy the special effects, the cinematography, and its budget. This budget for this film was $10 million, which was a lot of money. That was a groundbreaking part of that film in, in, in those days also. And um, there's so much to talk about. We have about an hour to talk about. And uh, after about 40 minutes or so, I will uh, start taking questions from the audience. So as a ground rule, at about 40 minutes from now, uh, if you're in the balcony, make your way down to the ground floor here because there'll be a couple of microphones in the audience and you'll have to come down here to ask those questions uh, to get into the discussion. Um, we'll talk about all aspects of the film, forward-looking, you know, uh, we'll talk about Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke a little bit, people knew them. We have really a, a, a stellar, right, as Ed Sullivan used to say, right here on our stage, we have a stellar uh, group of people who are perfectly suited to talk about this film, about the era that it happened, and, and about uh, the making of the movie and what it means. And I'm just going to go right through that, because we do a so, so a short amount of time. I'm going to go right to introducing our guest. Right on my left is, is Buzz Aldrin. People on the Moon, and, and he's also the author of a, of a couple of novels. He's the founder of this, uh, the Share Space Foundation to privatize space and make uh, space travel accessible to everyone. We'll talk about that a little bit. I want to talk about that with Buzz. Uh, uh, next to uh, Buzz, right on uh, on his left, is Andrean. Anybody, everyone know who Andrean is? She is the co-producer, co-creator of Contact, a motion picture based that she co-wrote with Carl Sagan, and it was starring Jodie Foster. It was a terrific, terrific film, and there are parallels between, you know, encountering aliens in that film and what the aliens were like in 2001 that we'll get into a little bit, maybe right at the beginning. Um, she's also the founder and president of the Carl Sagan Foundation. She does lots of things, including trying to get a space sale going up in space, which is a really interesting project. Uh, next to Annie is Marvin Minsky. He's... <laughs> He's co-founder of uh, the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. He uh, has made many contributions to artificial intelligence, cognitive psychology, mathematics, computational linguistics, robotics, and optics. Um, and he worked as an advisor to Stanley Kubrick. Um, in recent years, he's, he's worked chiefly on imparting to machines the human capacity for common sense reasoning. Um, his con conception of human intellectual structure and function is presented in the Society of Mind. That's a book and a CD-ROM and also the name of the course he teaches at MIT. So welcome, uh, Marvin, to the, to the panel. Uh, last but not least is a um, giant guy. I didn't realize how big Matthew Modine is. <laughs> Are you six seven? Something like six. I am. You're a giant in my mind. Director, actor Matthew Modine, who's uh, he was a writer and director. He has he has a a, a, a short. They call a short a film that's being that debuted last night. So they debuted last night right here, at Tribeca. I think I thought it's uh, it's about the danger of thinking. Right? Uh, one, how dangerous thinking can be, and not everybody should be given that gift to be able to allow <laughs> to think. And um, he's also starred in that very much acclaimed uh, Vietnam War, uh, anti-war film, I guess, Full Metal Jacket, 
which is a terrific film. Also, also directed by Stanley Kubrick. So you see, well, there is a thread up here in the panel a little bit, and uh, we'll, we'll get right into this. One of the things that I noticed, and I've, I was out there in the audience watching the film also with you, and this makes about the, the, the fourth, fifth, sixth time I've seen the film. Uh, Andrea, and this film seems, eight, it held up very well 40 years, 40 years, has it not? Now, why do you think that is? Do I have to do anything to this? There you go. Okay, great. Um, you know, it felt to me like the artifact of a lost civilization. So brilliant, so far-seeing, so courageous, so contemplative. It was like a meditation by someone who had survived post-Copernican stress syndrome and was courageous and imaginative enough to really get us out there, to take us out there. I thought it was magnificent. I think one of the reasons that it holds up so brilliantly is um, the tolerance for ambiguity that Stanley Kubrick and Arthur Clarke uh, bravely, you know, it, this movie plays now like a art film, like some kind of avant-garde, slow, amazingly meditative film. And the idea that there could be a Hollywood budget for a film that is artistically as audacious and fearless as this movie makes me feel as if we have gone so far backwards <laughs> from that <laughs> I'd just like to say that one of the reasons I think it holds up so well is that there's something eternally enigmatic and beautiful and timeless about certain geometric solids. <laughs> they never get old, you know? There's, you look at the, at the monolith and there's nothing dated about it. Um, it goes right back to Euclid and it was new and beautiful then and it still is now. Just a magnificent film. The stagecraft, the acting, the poignancy of how. The fact that without an ounce of sentimentality in in the whole movie, the death of Hal, the demise of Hal, has a power to it that really gets you. I, I'm lost in admiration for this movie. Well, there's so much to talk about here. Uh, I don't know which direction to go, but I'll, let's go with Hal for a minute. Uh, Marvin Minsky, um, are we? Hal has a real personality and a personality problem. Is it a death wish? Um, how close are we to creating a computer or artificial intelligence, something like Hal, and, or do we not want to? Do we, do we want to do that? You'll need to pick the microphone. Thank you. Boo. Boo. Well, I have a remark about something Ann said. Uh, namely, at the beginning, uh, Stanley used a tetrahedron, which is an equilateral triangular pyramid and he was showing some brushes of it to some people, he told me. And they said, what shape is that? Because you've never seen a, a triangular pyramid and it doesn't look right, a uh, four-sided thing. So he changed it to the monolith, but... Uh, I think it works, doesn't it? I was struck by the idea of people looking at this and saying, what shape is it? Uh, anyhow, <clears throat> Uh, yes, there's almost nothing resembling common sense even today. And the reason, <clears throat> I usually give a two hour lecture on this, so stop me, Ira. Uh, <laughs> You've got about a minute left. <laughs> okay. Uh, there was a great deal of progress from about the middle 1950s when computers first appeared to around 1980, and I, uh, all sorts of things uh, looked very promising. But then suddenly the field of artificial intelligence split into uh, fragments because some people said, well, this is going too slow. And they said, let's find the one best approach and work on that. Well, some people worked on statistical uh, prediction and some people worked on making insect-like robots with the idea if you can make a simple robot, it'll grow. Some people made genetic systems that could learn a little bit and they said, well, if we make it big enough, 
it'll get smarter and smarter, and none of them ever did. So AI split into about eight different fields, and there are perhaps 100,000 people working in this field, but there's only a dozen in the whole world working on common sense, the kinds of things that uh, no machine knows that you can pull things with a string, but you can't push it, and why? So uh, I'm trying to get more people to go back to this, and uh, I think it's impossible to predict because the speed of a field depends on how many smart people you get. And from 1980 to now, most of the smart people couldn't get research support because in the United States there is almost no basic research support anymore. So they all had to start companies and make search engines and stuff like that. And some of them made billions, but they didn't make any great progress. Okay, Marvin, time's up. <laughs> we'll get back. We'll get back to Marvin after these other comments. Um, thank you. No, it's interesting, and you, as you say, and you have written lectures. I've read them that could go on and, and explain them. And we'll get back to some of those points. But I want to uh, ask Buzz Aldrin a question because I remember hearing Arthur C. Clarke asked at, at, a, at a, an anniversary of uh, the Apollo moon landing, "What was the most astonishing thing about going to the moon?" And he says, "It, it was that we could go to the moon and not go back again." Do you, do, what, what's your reaction to that? Do you agree with that? Well, um, we haven't gone back, and, uh, and I think uh, for those who maybe lived through that period, we can reflect back and see uh, maybe a lot of opportunities that, uh, that were missed then. Uh, there were political influences, there was a lot of activity going on in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, drawing attention away from uh, uh, from the more um, ordinary ex exploration activities, uh, <clears throat> and I think we uh, we noticed that there was not that support uh, for continuing the the lunar landings, and and we embarked on something that I think uh, we would probably uh, think many times. Uh, before we would do that same sort of thing again. I think it was well motivated because the success we had, um, and, and I'm happy to see that uh, it was further setbacks that caused us to realize that we have to now uh, reach our course back into uh, exploration, <clears throat> hopefully before the rest of the world uh, catches up with us. Uh, and I'm sure that most of us back in those days felt that, uh, well, yeah, it's probably going to keep going in some way or another. But then we got into uh, watching the design uh, uh, suggestions come up for the space shuttle. So we, but the film shows a moon base yeah, and moving on. Sure does. None of that stuff ever happened. No. Well, uh, there, <laughs> there are a lot of times that uh, making a movie and the imagination uh, tends to get people a little carried away from what the, the reality really is. Uh, I marvel at the fact that we were able to do what we did uh, as rapidly as we did. <coughs> uh, but I also understand uh, the, the shortcomings of uh, what we've uh, not been able to do since then, and they fit in a pattern when you choose uh, a, a route that just isn't going to, to lead toward opening opportunities. I, I could listen to Marvin and I could listen to any uh, uh, talk about these things because they're, they're artists in a way and, and I'm an operator. And uh, I, I began uh, thinking about uh, the artificial intelligence uh, and, and we're replacing fighter pilots now not that they're all that smart to begin with, <laughs> but, but uh, they're uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, but they just don't go out and do their own thing by themselves. They got somebody sitting back near Las Vegas, uh, very comfy, and, uh, and he has all the information, uh, and he can control uh, what it is they're doing. And uh, they have remarkable uh, sensors uh, that, there's so many things that I saw from an operator's standpoint that uh, we would not have done at all. And, and I have to remind myself and, and the people here, when this came out, um, I'm not sure exactly when in 1968 I saw this, but uh, 
I, I remind myself that I had done space walking in November of 1966. And, uh, and so I had a, a, a rather uh, critical analysis of some of the things like... What was the like, worst way? You didn't think that it was portrayed the correct way, or the spirit, or, or what? Your critical analysis. Well, well we created, uh, or Arthur and Stanley created situations that caused great concern among us, but we never would have let the guy get into any situations like that. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, we. So, and, and anyway, in, in, uh, in 1968, I was also uh, assigned to uh, the backup crew for Apollo 8, which was, uh, as its mission changed and evolved, and the crew uh, assignments changed. Originally, we were going to fly one flight of Apollo unmanned on a Saturn I, and then we were going to start out with the lunar lander, testing it in Earth orbit twice before thinking about uh, sending the lander to the moon. <clears throat> well, for the second Apollo mission, the lander was not ready. So they took us, who were, who were on the third mission, and moved us to the second mission without a lander, and the orbit uh, started getting bigger and bigger, and pretty soon uh, it was going to go to the moon and orbit the moon. Uh, and the reason for that was because uh, it looked like the, the Soviets had a, a Zond mission uh, that they had sent uh, twice to the moon, unmanned, uh, where it circled around the moon and came back, and it looked as though if they had the confidence, they could have sent, sent a cosmonaut uh, on that same kind of mission and recovered him, not in the Indian Ocean or not in the Aral Sea, but uh, uh, somewhere perhaps on land in Kazakhstan where they, where they bring things back now. Uh, but that's why we accelerated the, the mission of Apollo 8. Let me ask you, uh, uh, from an actor's point of view, when you were being directed by Stanley Kubrick, what was, what was that like? I mean, was, did he, what was your reaction? I understand there was an incident with you and a camera and one of your cameras took issue with filming that you were doing or something? Not a, no issue at all. No issue. No, I, a friend of mine gave me an old Roloflex camera and, and said that uh, if, if I learned how to use this camera that it could be something to break the ice with Stanley. And so I taught myself how to use the Roloflex, which is a beautiful camera. I thought it was the camera that they took to the moon, but I, I think you guys took up Hassel, Hasselblad's. Yeah, no. um, and the first thing Stanley said when he saw this old camera that I had was, what are you doing with that old piece of shit? And he told me which camera to go buy if I was going to take pictures on the set, which lenses to buy, all the way down to like the camera strap and the camera bag of what, what, what I needed to use to take pictures. But um, he, about acting, um, he, he'd obviously read you know, all the books about acting and, uh, you know, Stanislavski's book and Lee Strasberg and Stella Adler. He knew, knew that I had studied with Stella, so I think he did some, some background research on that. And um, uh, it was funny about acting, to talk to Stanley about acting, because, um, well, like, it, how many actors in the audience? Is there many actors here? It, no, no actors. Oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> Zero actors. How many directors in the audience? Yeah, um, not very many of those either. So a bunch of scientists? <laughs> Who are you people? <laughs> um, You're on your own on this. Yeah, so I, I had, a, there was one time when we'd done a lot of takes, uh, several dozen takes, and um, so I decided, like, maybe in the middle of the scene to pick up a bottle of water and take a drink, and we finished this, and Stanley came over and he said, what was that? And I said, what? And he said, in the middle of the scene, you picked up a bottle of water and drank water. I said, yeah, yeah. I, well, I figured you didn't like the several other dozens of takes that I did, so I thought I'd try something different. <laughs> He'd say, oh, that was a choice. That's what actors call a choice. I said, yeah, I made a choice to drink water from the bottle and another thing. He said, oh, good. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's do it again and, and do your choice. <laughs> so we did, we did that several times and... Uh, uh, you know, several dozen takes of me drinking from the bottle of water, and then Stanley came over and he sat down next to me. He goes, "You know that thing you're doing with the water? Don't do it." <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, 
I love this film. I just want to point, I, th I agree with Anne. I think this is one of the most poetic, beautiful films. It continues to be present. It continues to be something that is in the future. It's the most, it, it still looks more futuristic than any futuristic film ever made. Um, I think it has one of the greatest cuts in the history of editing, which is, uh, you know, it, I, I, it's difficult, I don't know who said this, somebody, somebody compressed time into a 24-hour clock, that if you were to say that the, this is the Big Bang, I'm going to upset all of you uh, creationists right now. The world's older than 2,000 years old. Uh, so, yeah, so if you compress time into a span between my hands, and it, it is a 24-hour clock, right? And man has only existed the last second of the 24th hour. Some extraordinary thing, no? Yeah. Just the last few minutes of the cosmic calendar, if you took from the Big Bang right. to the and present yeah. and made that a year. A year. She's saying it's even smaller than what you're giving. Yes, it's just a, a it's few even smaller than a year. Even smaller. Right. Than even right. smaller. Well, right. it's a little tiny bit of time. <laughs> so, now, now this. So, the, so if this is the second of early man till this moment, then it's only a fraction of a second that we know about, and. You know, there was something, like a tree of knowledge, a monolith. Uh, 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 I, 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 there's a man from Berkeley who, who wrote a book called The Food of the Gods, uh, named, uh, does anybody know that book, Food of the Gods? Terence McKenna. Terence McKenna, who posed that it was, uh, as we were hunter-gatherers, that we came upon psychotropic drugs that made us conscious of our consciousness. Um, I think it's a, good, it's a good explanation as any. Um, <laughs> But now, it's, <laughs> but this is what, this is what all this is driving to was was that when I came back, having never known till this day that Marvin Minsky had worked with Stanley Kubrick on 2001, had been offered to play chess with Stanley Kubrick on 2001, was friends with Stanley Kubrick. When I came back from London, I bought a book by Marvin Minsky called Society of Mind. And I started reading this book, and Stanley had talked a lot about acting. Just to, to finish your question, Ira, he talked a lot about acting. And I was reading Marvin's book, and, and Stanley said, you know, the, the lines have to be in you, they were, they were, he, he, that they needed to be really in you. And as I read Marvin's book about, about uh, how a child learns, how we go through the process of learning, that, that a child reaches, you know, first they have to discover that this is attached to them. I think that's how it begins in the book, that discovering that this is the end of their body. And then, discover, you know, the, the discovery that this is attached to you. All these are, are little steps of, of, along the way of us educating ourselves. And, and then that reaching for something, to get to the point where, as an adult, you could have a cup of tea in your hand and, and, and on a saucer and walk across the room and have to stop and tamp that. Your body learns how to do that. That's learned, you know, muscle coordination. And without spilling the cup of tea, without bringing it up to your face and having it run down, down your face, that all these things are taught, you know, and, and that's what Stanley, when, when I read Marvin's book, I thought that's what Stanley's trying to get to with, with actors, is that the, the words and the character has to be so in you that it has to be like that person who can carry a cup of tea across the room. That you can't think about what it is you're saying. If you're thinking, then you're not being. And that was a, a big lesson in life, and I think it's a big lesson for all of us, is the whole journey of becoming an artist, or becoming a scientist, becoming a person, that it is the discovery of self, of being. And it's a, it's a, it's a hell of a journey. <laughs>